Hello there. Today I want to teach you effect deeply. I want to cut out effects bleeding heart and present it to you for your eager consumption. And what I mean by that is I want to solve two barriers to the adoption of effect. One is the perceived complexity. This is essentially the cost of learning effect, and I would say that many people think that it's too damn high. The second barrier is the value proposition. This would be the benefit, and this is possibly too confusing or unclear, Blah. which essentially makes it too low. So hopefully we can both lower the activation cost and sweeten the deal of paying it, we will attempt to do this by building a replica, a simplified pedagogical replica of effect focused on that beating heart I was describing earlier. And I do promise you it is stupidly simple. So let us get started with implementing thunk effect. To begin, we will discuss the thunk. Perhaps you've heard of this fun onomatopoetic term. It is simply an alias for a function of no arguments, a so-called nullary function. We have simply trapped some result behind a function arrow. Let's look at an example. Firstly, we usually write code in the following manner, this imperative direct style, whatever you want to call it. Here we have a random number, which is the result of calling math.random. And then we might want to log the result of this random number, random number. And I will do this thrice and even label them for fun. And now I will run this file. Unsurprisingly, random numbers one, two, and three are all the same random number. This probably doesn't shock anyone. When we were all learning to program, we painstakingly built a model of program execution into our own minds. And we know that generally programs are executed from top to bottom. And that when we see some sort of variable definition, whatever occurs to the right-hand side of the equal sign will be evaluated. And then its resultant value will be stashed into that identifier. And subsequent references to it will just all point to that first result. Nothing complicated so far. Now, let's duplicate this and change it to a random number thunk. As stated, that's the same thing, except now it is a function that returns a number. In order to thunkify our math.random call here, we will simply add a function arrow in front of it. And I will relabel these here and reference random number thunk. Now, if I rerun it, we will, of course, see the name. I don't think I'm going to be teaching anyone anything new yet by stating that in order to execute this function, we have to add some opening and closing parens. And when I rerun it, it is likely that everyone understands that now, instead of math.random being executed on line 18, it is instead stored off inside of a function that is executed on an ad hoc basis whenever we call that function thusly. So if you understand this, you have what it takes to understand the power of effect systems. I swear to you that this will give effect approximately 80% of its value. If you've ever heard of effect described as a blueprint or a workflow or a description or a program as a value or a computation as a value, this inertness of an effect, there isn't some secret recipe for doing this. There isn't some secret ingredient excised from the texts of category theory and transplanted into TypeScript. No, it is simply the function value, the function, the thunk. This is what connotes the blueprintness, the workflowness, the thunkiness. What does it do? Well, it allows us to store off not only a value, but an entire sequence of instructions, an entire program in this inert casing, and then call it later on. Which is why we can now view this random number thunk more as perhaps a recipe. Oh, that's another metaphor that is sometimes used. With our imperative direct random number definition here, we have lost all of the steps that it took to compute this number. We are simply left with the smoldering remains of some computation. But when it's thunkified, we've captured the full process. So now that we understand what a thunk is, now that we understand that we've always known what a thunk is and that it's rather trivial, the question is, what powers does the thunk give us? And let us begin first by renaming thunk to effect, understanding that going forward, this implementation of effect is no more than a thunk that returns an A. So the first power is that of repeatability. We've already explored this to some extent. We can call random number effect as many times as we desire. No times, infinite times. But it's not very fun to do this all by hand. Instead, we're going to implement a higher level combinator called repeat. And this is going to be a function that takes an effect of some type A, and then a count, how many times we would like it repeated. And it's going to return an effect, aka a thunk, of an array of A. So now let's implement this. We can start out by just simply returning an empty array, and we will see, in fact, that this does not compile. 
because an empty array is not an effect of A. Remember that we need to return an effect here, and to do that we need to funkify our result. And so this does compile and type check. It is of course not semantically correct. We want to execute the effect count a number of times and collect those results into the array. And so to implement this correctly, instead of returning this directly, I will create a results array and return it at the end. And then we'll have a little for loop here. I set to zero, while I is less than count. We will increment I and we will push into our array the result of calling an effect each time. In order to make this easier to test, let us first write a run function that will take some effect of type A, and we will simply console.log the result of calling that effect. So now I can run the result of repeating random number effect 10 times. Let's execute this, and we see an array here of 10 random numbers. Let me just run this four times. And so already that's kind of cool. If it's not clear, let's just briefly talk through what's happening. At the core, we have random number effect, which is simply a thunk, a computation that describes how to get a random number, which it does by simply calling math.random. Then we pass that effect, that thunk, into our repeat function, and our repeat combinator takes the effect, the random number effect, and a count, and it is implemented by looping count number of times, executing the underlying effect each of those times, storing its results into this array, and most critically, wrapping this all up in its own thunk. This is the key difference of effect systems, that operations on effects always wrap their results back up inside of another thunk. This makes the entire thing completely pose elegantly. It remains suspended. It remains a description. Nothing happens until you finally, at the end of the world, run your effect. Generally, in an effect application, this will be done once at the top of your application. So everything in your program are these composable, self-similar effects. We can, of course, repeat the repetition. Let me make it two by two here and run this. We're going to get two nested arrays of two random numbers apiece. And this is possible, of course, once again, because repeat itself returns an effect, which we can pass right back into repeat as its first argument. It's worth reiterating that the underlying property here is dead simple. It is simply a function value, something we all understand. And the only trick that effect pulls is keeping things inside of function values most of the time, maintaining that property of thunkiness, blueprintness, inertness, allowing us to build larger blueprints out of smaller blueprints. And there isn't some magical technique to doing this. It's simply wrapping everything back up in a thunk. That is maintaining the blueprint. The thunk is the blueprint. Okay, we spent a little too long on repeatability. Let us get to the next power, which is going to be retryability. It's pretty similar. In order to test this correctly, we will need a failing effect. And in order to implement this, we will get our hands on a random number, and then we will check to see if x is less than 0 0.7. If it is, we will throw a new error, kaboom, and otherwise we will simply return the number. All right, now that we have our unreliable effect implemented, we can now implement the retry combinator, which will take an effect of type A once more, and a maximum number of attempts we wish to permit, and this will return, once again, an effect of A. And because it returns an effect, we need to return, therefore, a thunk. And if we want to get this to compile right off the bat, we can simply return the result of calling the effect. But the idea here is going to be that that underlying effect might throw, so we want to wrap it in a try-catch block. But we only wish to throw if our remaining attempts equals zero, and then we can rethrow it. Otherwise, we want to keep trying. So we'll wrap this in a while loop, and then we will set remaining attempts equal to the maximum number of attempts. And then of course, we also must decrement that count in here. So let's quickly see if this actually works. So I will run the result of retrying our failing effect. And so we can see what's going on. I will also come back up here and just console log out. Oops, we got the number X. Jumping back down at the bottom, I will now run our file. And that's funny, we actually lost all five times. So we tried five times in a row, and then it exploded. I don't think we'll have such poor luck again if I rerun, or we will. This is why I don't gamble. Okay, the third time, we end up succeeding on our third attempt. Oops, oops, hooray. So once again, nothing magical here, but it becomes really easy to write these superpowered combinators, which all exploit the fact that we have the full description of the underlying effect. If we desired, we could also very quickly implement an even more forgiving eventually combinator that did not even accept a maximum number of attempts and simply continually retried the underlying effect. So I could just say eventually failing effect, and now no matter how bad my luck is, I will eventually win. All right, I failed five times, yet still succeeded. Let me close this and comment out our run line. All right, we're at the final power for today, which I'm going to call aroundability, though perhaps it's better named instrumentability or uh, decorability. 
And shockingly, this also falls out of the fact that we have captured our program, suspended it, encased it as a little value here. Because we have our thunk, we can, of course, call our thunk and do something afterwards, but we can also do something before calling our thunk. And then, of course, we can thunkify this whole biz. So once again, simple yet powerful. We can do things around our computation. And to exemplify this capability, we will implement the timed combinator, which will once more accept an effect of A, I'm not tired of it, and return another effect of not only A, but a tuple of the result of that underlying effect computation, but also the duration, a number, representing the time in milliseconds for how long it took to compute that result. And this once more must return A, thunk, and we can return an empty array and have TypeScript be sad with us. And so now we need the result, and we can get that by calling our underlying effect, but we also need the duration, and we can calculate this by subtracting some start timestamp from some end timestamp, and we can get this by grabbing at the start date dot now, and also at the end, before and after, aroundable. Now we can simply return the duration and the result. And now we could try to run it. So we want to run some timed effect, but the question is which effect? Let's do eventually, again, with failing effect, just for fun. But then let's jump up to its implementation and make it increasingly unlikely that we will ever succeed. And let's just take a gamble. <gasps> All right, that took us 60 milliseconds. Let me run that again. Ooh, only seven milliseconds. Let me add a couple more nines. All right, one entire second. Cool, so we can see that it does indeed work. Let me quickly extract this to timed failure, run timed failure, so we can just see what the type of this is. And it is, of course, an effect that will return that tuple of the duration, which is a number, and then the result, which is also a number. So we get that type safety. The A has been inferred to be a number because the type of the effect that we're passing in returns a number. That's just TypeScript. All right, so let me close this out and comment out our run here. And let's take a step back for a moment and recap. I would argue that nothing here that we've done is terribly complicated whatsoever. Maybe it's not even interesting, in which case I'm sorry to you. Hopefully it seems too simple. And if that is indeed the case, then perhaps I have solved problem number one. Solved. See, just the right amount of cost. And of course, these three powers are quite compelling, so... The value proposition is almost too good to be true at this point. And if you're thinking that, though it is true that I've elided a few uncomfortable truths, while effects thunkfulness really does enable most of its capabilities, we haven't handled a couple of things here. We haven't handled structured concurrency. There is no asynchronicity here. It's all synchronous. And we haven't handled any of the contextual dependency injection abstractions that effect enables. Perhaps I will record a video on those. And there is one other slight detail I've omitted, which is that I've danced around sequencing effects. We do have effect composition. We were passing and failing effects into our different combinators. However, we never did one thing and then did another thing based on its result. And this is, of course, because the results of our effects are trapped within them. They're trapped within the thunk. And while we could just run them all the time, getting the result and using it to do something else, well, we've now lost the thunkfulness. Actually, I don't think run returns the result at this moment. I should probably have it do that. Const result equals effect. Then we can log it, and then we can return the result. So now this will return an A. Okay, so now result returns, or is typed as, a duration and a result tuple. But we don't want to do this, because we lose all the powers that we just worked so hard to gain. We want to keep our program in the effect, in the suspended computation, as a description. We don't want to run it too soon. We don't want to detonate our dynamite too early. And so whereas with the normal imperative direct style of programming, you just get this nice top to bottom sequencing of commands, you assign the results of previous commands to some identifier and you use them in subsequent lines of the program, we cannot do this without running our effect. And this is mostly just an arbitrary historical syntactic reality that we have to deal with. JavaScript syntax doesn't natively handle effects. It has enhanced its syntax to deal with promises with async await, and that really is just a syntactic transformation. An effect is not a promise. It is better in nearly every way, but unfortunately does not inherit that special syntax. Not yet, at least. So therefore, in effect, we have to do two things. One is we have to write our own composition operators. We don't just get the free sequential composition of the new line that imperative programs do. Instead, we have to write combinators like and then, or sometimes flat map or map, which will take one effect of some type A, as well as a function that will take the result of that first effect, and it can return a second effect, an effect of B. 
and this whole thing will return an effect of b. And to quickly implement this, I simply return a thunk. I can get myself an a by calling the original effect. I can then get myself an effect of b by passing that a into that function. And then I can return the result of calling that effect of b. And if I could just quickly implement an effectful logging helper here, I can take any message that's a string, and this will return an effect of void. Therefore, it needs to return a thunk. We can just delegate to console log in here. I can now make a new composed program where I take my timed failure and pass that in as the first argument to and then. I will then get that duration and that result, and I can call log duration, duration, and result, result. And what we have now is a composed effect of void. If I comment out these run lines above, and run my composed effect and execute this program, we will see a bunch of oopses. And then finally, our log that took 11 seconds. And our final winning result was, of course, many, many nines. And then run itself log the result of the void, but that doesn't matter. And so this is the price we must pay. In order to maintain effectfulness, the inherent recipe nature of effect that makes it so powerful in giving us these capabilities and many more, we have to implement our own special composition operators. But luckily, the lovely people behind effect came up with a pretty good substitute, something much closer to async await than wrapping a bunch of and thens together. First of all, there's this pipe syntax, which I'm not going to show here, which is a bit better, but there's also this generator syntax. And for this, I'm not going to get into the implementation because it really doesn't matter. All that really matters are its semantics, not the peculiarities of its implementation. So here, we'll see almost the same program. First, here we are timing the eventual success of our very unlikely failing effect, getting both the duration and the result, logging that out, and then finally returning yay. And if I were to run this new composed generator, we should see that it works just the same. All right, 13 seconds. And so if we squint here, it looks almost like the imperative program that we wish perhaps we could write. Const duration result equals timed eventually failing effect, then logging that result, and then whatever, returning yay, I suppose. And the only real difference here is that we have to account for which values are effects and which aren't. And in order to actually trigger their execution, we just throw yield in front of any effectful value. Though in the actual effect library, you will see yield star for reasons. Of course, this is also very similar to something like async await. This is some fake syntax here. So if you understand async await, if you understand imperative programming, the price of using generator functions to write your sequential programs whilst maintaining all of the benefits of effect, I think you would agree that this is a very minor price to pay. So yeah, that's all I've got to say about thunks. I hope you've learned almost nothing yet feel much better and much less intimidated by effect and are somewhat titillated by its potential. Have a beautiful life.